silence your microphone from those words, okay? Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the main session on development, innovation, and economic issues titled Effective Policies for Inclusive and Prosperous Digital Transformation, What's Needed. Information and communications technologies, including the internet and emerging technologies, have the potential to act as catalysts for the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and help advance all 17 sustainable development goals and constituent targets. At the same time, rapid technological change poses new challenges and can have unintended consequences. We have convened leading experts from diverse and relevant stakeholders and communities to explore policy considerations and approaches needed to leverage the internet and ICTs to facilitate common development goals and present how the IGF communities are engaging in work related to the sustainable development goals. Therefore, this main session will consist out of three sections. In the first segment, we will be setting the scene through expert interventions and deliberations. In the second segment, we will invite IGF Dynamic Coalitions to intervene on the connection of their work to the Sustainable Development Goals. And in the third segment, we will have a question and answer session where I invite you to raise comments and questions to our panelists and key participants. My name is Nadia, I am a social entrepreneur at SUNIUM and sit on the steering committee of the DC Youth Coalition on Internet Governance. It's my pleasure to co-moderate this session today. And I'm joined by my co-moderator, Diego Molano, the chair of the International Chamber of Commerce's Business Action to Support the Information Society Initiative and former minister for ICT of Colombia. So I would love to invite Diego to introduce our experts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here after uh, lunch. Um, <clears throat> this is going to be a, a, a long session, uh, but I think, uh, I think it is going to be very, very productive. So my first task is to introduce uh, our panelists. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, uh, not doing my task. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, so, but before that, <clears throat> in order to, to really get to know each other a little bit better, uh, I'm going to ask everybody to introduce yourselves and also tell us something else about you. Tell us something not related to your job. Tell us a secret that you haven't told anyone. <laughs> and I'm going to start myself. My name is Diego Molano. I'm a Colombian, and uh, I'm the chair of uh, BASIS at ICC. Uh, and my secret is that I really can't sleep, not because of jet lag. It is because on Thursday night, I have to get home to have a very serious talk to my wife. Uh, basically, because in this uh, new world of entrepreneurship, I invested uh, our savings of, of, of two year savings in, into a venture capital fund and it collapsed. So I have to, and, and she told me not to do it, but I did it without her authorization. So I'm in trouble. Uh, so that's my secret. So l l let's start with Celine. Celine, please introduce yourself. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. yes. All right. So my name is Celine Sada Benaben. Um, I am the general manager for eBay in France. I've been with eBay for 12 years, and I've been working in the field of e-commerce for close to 20 years. Um, so quite a long time. Um, the things I haven't told anyone, and that's not going to help my credibility, is I once was goofy in a Disneyland park. So wow. picture me as goofy. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. Jackson, it is your turn. Thank you very much. My name is Jackson Cheboy. Um, I come from the Communications Authority of Kenya, where, where the national site is being hosted. Um, my DNA traces back to law enforcement. So I've worked a very long uh, path from systems to digital forensics um, in law enforcement. And uh, probably in the next two or so years, I'll be going to farming. 
I'm pleased to be here with you. Thank you. Farming great. Bishaka. Hello. I'm Bishaka Datta, and I live in Mumbai, India, where I run a nonprofit called Point of View, which works on gender, sexuality, and technology, as well as disability. My secret, I'm tempted to make up a fictional secret, but I'll tell you a true secret, which is that I'm actually a DJ in training, so I've been taking wow. DJ wow. lessons. So can we try that tonight? <laughs> Andres. Hello, I am Andres Sastre from ASIED, who is the Latin American Enterprises Associ Telecommunication Association. Uh, I am Spanish, but I'm working in Uruguay, so I have to say that I, I like mate. But really, I don't like very much. It's the first time I said. <laughs> Good, mate. But you know, Nadia, you haven't told us your secret. Oh, my secret. Um, my secret is, is that I composed a song to submit for the Eurovision for, but I didn't submit it. <laughs> so it looks like tonight we can really have a good party, DJ and a, and a singer and a <laughs> songwriter. That's fantastic. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it, is, it is the time for our, our, our panelists to, to have their first talk. And uh, therefore I would like to take over and ask uh, Mr. Justin Chaboy, um, what barriers do developing countries face when deploying projects to facilitate digital transformation and what lessons can be learned that can be used to build pragmatic, scalable and replicable models? I kindly ask you to stick to the three minutes that we have been able to allocate for this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, digital transformation um, is imperative for all. I mean industries, businesses, from small to big ones, governments, and name it. It's much of a change, a cultural change. Uh, although it's um, common, uh, although it shares some common challenges globally, which uh, Turkey will allude to that, uh, including budgetary constraints, lack of full. Uh, visibility across the digital or end user experience, lack of buying from the leadership on prioritizing the initiatives. You find that in developing economies, there are unique challenges or barriers um, that impaired um, the transformation. Most of it is because of the culture. People misconstrued when they put the first one as infrastructure, which is not the case. It's lack of general understanding on uh, the whole concept of digital um, transformation. Second one is the complexity and rigidity in legacy um, infrastructure and systems calling for expensive uh, bridges between them which sometimes do not um, work compatibly hence dropping the whole idea and it's costly. Third one is the lack of um, skilled personnel, which is synonymous to the developing economies, given the fact that the technology and more of its knowledge base is not within those uh, countries. Cybersecurity has scared away also such economies because the fear of the unknown attributed by both, uh, 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 both poor legal and regulatory environment and this has made people not to accept the move towards the transformation. 
last one is about the exponential growth and diversification of technology that has caused the race um, to catch it up, especially in developing economies um, becoming too high in speed, hence um, such uh, economies tend to drop from it. Wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you, Jackson. Uh, I think we're gonna switch to Spanish if uh, you can have your headphones. Andres, Andres, tú, tú, tú representas a, a las empresas de telecomunicaciones en, en América Latina que en su gran mayoría son privadas. Un, un ecosistema interoperable, eh, estable, es crucial para que nosotros, en, 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 en los, los ciudadanos y la gente, se beneficie de, la, de las tecnologías eh, y se beneficie del desarrollo, de las oportunidades de desarrollo que van a haber. ¿Qué rol juega el sector privado para facilitar esta tarea? Bueno, muchas gracias, Diego. Muchas gracias por la pregunta. Pues, siendo concretos con los tres minutos que tenemos, el rol que tenemos que generar desde el sector privado es generar confianza a los ciudadanos, ¿no? seguir mejorando algunos de los aspectos que tenemos, seguir mejor, mejorando la confianza, mejorando la interoperabilidad de nuestros servicios y generar, sobre todo, contribuir con los gobiernos y con la academia, generar capital humano. Por parte, generando conecti seguir mejorando conectividad, infraestructura de conectividad, y esto tiene que ver con la parte de la interoperabilidad del sistema. ¿no? Eh, Hace mucho tiempo ya que los servicios de comunicaciones se basan en la conectividad global y universal y son interoperables a través de la numeración, los estándares abiertos. Sin embargo, en esto no sucede en toda la cadena del ecosistema digital. Tenemos que seguir avanzando la interoperabilidad en aquellos servicios que se dan sobre la red, eh, por ejemplo, los de voz IP o mensajería, donde la interoperabilidad quizás todavía no ha avanzado lo que debería. Ya podemos cambiar de una plataforma a otra, pero seguimos teniendo dudas de qué hacemos con nuestros datos. Y esto lo debemos seguir mejorando en aras de mejorar la competencia y la confianza del usuario. Y la confianza del usuario tiene que ver también con la seguridad y la privacidad. ¿no? Está claro que en, mmm, algo que necesitan las economías emergentes es digitalizar sus procesos productivos. Y esto pasa inexorablemente por el, la economía de datos y cómo jugar y crecer a través de los datos. Pero esto eh, no debe realizarse a costa de la privacidad de los ciudadanos. ¿no? Hace dos años en América Latina se hizo una encuesta sobre confianza y seguridad en los ciudadanos y el 64% de los usuarios decían que estaban más preocupados por la privacidad que hace un año. Y el 75% de los usuarios Estaban preocupados por el uso que se hacía de los datos por las empresas para fines comerciales o para algún tipo de fraude. Y esto también tenía que ver con las propias pequeñas empresas que tenían ciertamente bastante miedo de eh, digitalizar sus procesos productivos, acercarse a Internet por aquellas consecuencias que pudieran ver, como puede ser robo de información, ataques cibernéticos. O... Entonces, en, está en nuestro debe me, generar un sistema confiable un sistema donde la privacidad, donde el usuario sepa qué hace, cómo se gestionan sus datos, cómo se gestiona su privacidad. Y en eso, ayer eh, el presidente Macron hizo bastantes referencias a esto y creo que es eh, en nuestro rol como sector privado de ser proteger al usuario y proteger eh, su privacidad y a su vez poder maximizar el uso de los datos y desarrollar la, la economía, digitalizar los procesos productivos. Y otro déficit en el que puede colaborar el sector privado, eh, sobre todo en economías emergentes, es en la formación de capital humano. Para el caso de Latinoamérica, por ejemplo, hoy dos de cada tres jóvenes no están preparados para los trabajos que requieren competencias técnicas y de gestión. Eh, hay que actualizar los problemas educativos, eh, no solo para que aprendan tecnologías, sino para que puedan crear nuevas tecnologías. Y en eso el sector privado podemos colaborar con la academia y con gobiernos en que esto pueda ser posible. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Uh, there, then I would like to invite uh, Celine Sadavanavan to uh, answer this question. What are the main policy elements necessary to help encourage and scale up innovation and investment in ICTs? Um, how can we make sure that small businesses and enterprises in remote locations can benefit? 
Thank you very much. Let me do that in French English. Um, I, I do believe that private companies, and in particular eBay, already create digital opportunities for very small companies and for companies of all sizes. Since its creation over 20 years ago, eBay has been providing a secure and global platform that enables all sellers from all sizes and almost all countries to reach the world um, and to be able to sell their product to over 170 million buyers in the world. Today, we've got millions of sellers, small, large, again from very different countries. As an example, 99% of the small businesses we've got in France currently sell abroad in 20 countries and more. The only thing these companies have to do is to have the products. Once they've got the product, they list on the site and they don't need any form of investment. They only pay a small fee in case they sell. And they've got similar chances, chances sorry. wherever you are, whether you're a small company, whether you're an individual seller, whether you're someone who just has that as an additional job, you've got the same ch chances of being visible for all of the buyers in the world. And we do not have any product to push. We are completely convinced that SMBs will be creating growth in the future. We believe private companies such as and public authorities should join forces to enable that growth. The sellers are telling us the following elements and are giving us very consistent and pragmatic feedback on things we could help them with. The first one is making sure that everyone has full access to high-speed internet and everywhere. You don't want entrepreneurship to be hindered by a slow access to internet, or at least it shouldn't be the objective. This is the first side of the coin. Once you've got that, the second part that we need is shipping infrastructure and logistic infrastructure. We need the infrastructure to be fast. We need the infrastructure to be reliable. You need the infrastructure to be affordable and you need it to be transparent. If you want to sell a product across products, you can't ask a small SMB or an individual seller to have four different traffic numbers, tracking numbers for their parcel to be able to share that information with buyer. Trust is critical and part of it relies on the ability to provide transparent information. The third thing that we need is simplicity and harmonization of the exports framework. That revolves around customs, that revolves around taxation, and around all of the administrative side that has to be done in every country. Again, just in Europe, how can you ask one seller to know all the VAT rates for each and every single of their product in the countries they're selling? These are some of the areas, and very simple and quite pragmatic, on which we need to work on collectively. We're very happy to be a sparing partner for the different governments to be able to review this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Celine. Um, now I'd like to invite uh, Bishaka. Uh, Bishaka, um, Jackson said, this is not about technology, this is about people. So the promise of technology depends greatly on the ability of the user to understand and engage with technology and in turn become a creator. What social and cultural policy considerations can help facilitate that? Okay, I think uh, this is a really important question. <clears throat> and I think the first social and consid cultural consideration actually has to be understanding that there is a very wide diversity of users of digital technologies, whether these are on old type simple phones or whether these are on more sophisticated devices that can access the internet. And that 
users of the internet occupy not just different countries or different languages or, diff or have different income levels, but actually also come from different genders, different sexual orientations, as well as different abilities. And that the internet as it currently stands perhaps is not a comfortable space for everybody, particularly people who come from less privileged or marginalized genders, sexual, sexualities, and abilities. So I think some of the cultural and social considerations would have to be when we talk about access. Is it enough for a community to have access to the internet, or do we need to go further and see who in that community actually gets access to the internet, particularly since this is shaped by cultural norms? I think which sometimes determine that women do not actually have very restricted or conditional access to the internet. I think it means looking at the whole concept of being a bystander on the internet. I, research is showing that many women, many girls, particularly from low income communities who do not speak English or who access the net in other languages, don't feel the sense of confidence, autonomy, agency, or belonging to actually participate meaningfully in these spaces and sometimes tend to become bystanders in these spaces. Very important to break this to sort of ensure that they can become creators as well. Thank you very much for your intervention. This now leads us to our second segment. And I would like to invite the Dynamic Coalitions to intervene and present findings and main takeaways from their work and uh, as it relates to the challenges of the digital transformation. So first I would like to invite Mr. Christopher Yu from DC on innovative approaches to connecting the unconnected. Thank you very much. It is an honor to be here. We are, uh, our work on the Dynamic Coalition on innovative approaches to connecting the unconnected is deeply committed to drawing the, conne the connection between internet connectivity and the SDGs. In fact, we, bel we believe and have been told by the, the international finance community that that is the missing link for unlocking much of the support and the investment to uh, make the dream of connecting the remaining half of the world that is not online and making it possible for them to enjoy the benefits of internet connectivity. So among the things we are doing is we are doing controlled trials using academic standards, the gold standard of social science research, our randomized controlled trials using a methodology known as difference in difference. This is the closest thing we have to measuring causation and it requires a, a great deal of field work and a lot of trust with various partners who are both deploying the technology and with governments who are collecting the information that provides the strongest basis for assessing the impact of the work that we are doing and that we are studying. And we have ongoing trials, controlled trials now in Rwanda, Vanuatu, and Nepal, looking at the use of connectivity for remote diagnosis for healthcare ailments, uh, maternal health, and also for economic development and education outcomes. And for the first time, we looked at the literature assuming that we could draw upon existing studies and learn from their methodologies. We were uh, alarmed and uh, fascinated to find out that no such studies exist. And when we publish our studies, they will be the first ones in the field. So we believe very strongly we are contributing, hopefully, to a better future. We are also participants in the Connecting and enabling next, the Next Billions project that's gone through four phases here at the Internet Governance Forum. In the last two years, uh, the last year was committed to studying four, three SDGs, four, five, and nine on education, gender, and infrastructure. Uh, this year was energy, seven, eight, nine, and 17, energy, work and economic growth, infrastructure, and partnerships. That work is ongoing, that uh, is available for comment and observation on the website, and we would invite your participation and if, uh, the entire community in making that work as strong as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, uh, Christopher. Now, I'd like to invite Olivier Crepin-Leblanc. 
Uh, Olivier is from the DC on uh, core. Okay, yeah. I'm uh, Siva Subramanian Muthuswami from the Dynamic Coalition of Internet Values, and I'm speaking for Olivier Kripen Leblond. The work that the Dynamic Coalition of uh, Core Internet Values, the work that it does relates to preserving the openness of the internet, preserving the internet as a free open, global, end-to-end -end network of networks. And in that sense, the work that uh, the coalition does helps accelerate the achievement of all the sustainable development goals. Be it um, decent work and economic growth, or uh, gender equality, or industry innovation, or, or infrastructure, reduce, reduced in inequalities. By preserving the internet as an open and uh, global medium, it provides, uh, the internet provides expanded opportunities and um, uh, connection across borders, which uh, fosters collaboration, which makes it possible to achieve all the sustainable development goals. And I was having a conversation with a friend, uh, a very short conversation. I was saying that throughout history, good people came together, good people with foresight came together to cause progress. I said that should happen in the internet, for the internet. He said, that is what is happening here. You'll find all the good people here. And that is what we do. I think by preserving uh, the internet, by preserving the internet as a global medium, by working on core values, we expand opportunities and uh, help uh, cost progress. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask Ms. Key, whether uh, from the DC on gender and internet governance, whether she could comment on the challenges of digital transformation, transformation pardon me, and digital divides specifically on, um, in relation to gender. Thank you very much. Um, the Gender Dynamic Coalition looks to a range of human rights issues as well as internet governance issues, including Goal 5 of the SDGs, which looks at gender in the context of sustainable development. And we would like to make three points in relation to, um, three points surfaced in relation to work on this. First is that addressing access is critical. I think this has been raised by several different people. Currently, there still exists a large gender digital divide. Um, the proportion of women using the internet is 12% lower than men globally, and this number is much bigger in several countries and region. And this gap is not just in terms of access to affordable connectivity and devices, but also the ability to use them freely in a way that realizes a range of their human rights and that takes into account existing inequalities. So for example, limitations to mobility or expression based on social norms. The second point is that data really matters. Right now, there is a critical gap in data that reflects the specificity and diversity of needs of sections of community. We barely have sex disaggregated data, which is just about seeing populations as men and women, never mind gender dis disaggregated data, which unpacks a more complex social, political, economic, and cultural context that impacts on a range of human rights and all of the SDGs. And there needs to be a commitment towards this. Um, for, this includes the work done by the Gender DC on the Gender Report Card of IGF that has been in place since um, 2016 um, in IGF in Mexico. And it showed that only roughly 50% of the workshop organizers filled in the report cards even after seven years that they were introduced. So this attitude, um, with this attitude, it's really difficult to take steps to close the gap. And the final point is that intersectionality is integral to this question. We are not single faceted people, um, but many intersecting factors impact on our ability to realize a range of rights. So this includes factors like disabilities, um, location, income, ethnic identities, and uh, sexual orientation and gender expression. And this matters on the way we ask questions on who matters, what are their needs and concerns, who are we building trust around or with whom, and the and the indicators that we're developing research around. This is to make sure that we are not developing policies or programs based on data sets that have folded in systemic and systematic bias that results in exacerbating inequalities. And goal 10 of the SDGs um, on reducing inequalities within and between countries compels an intersectionality approach. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. John Carr from the Dynamic Coalition on Child Protection. Thank you very much, and it's a great honor and privilege to be here. Um, 
uh, at the IGF again, uh, speaking on behalf of the coalition. Um, I represent here ECPAT International, which uh, I'm British, uh, live in London, but I'm representing ECPAT International, which is a global NGO um, based in uh, Bangkok. Um, it has members, national chapters in around 120 different countries on each of the continents. <clears throat> and they're engaged in a very wide range of work, all of which in one way or another relate to the, uh, to, to the SDGs. Uh, and we were very active as an organization um, in lobbying around the SDGs as they were uh, being written and developed through the, through the UN processes. And we were very, very pleased uh, in the end uh, to see that uh, I think it's five different SDGs specifically refer to different parts of our agenda. Those are articles uh, SDG 4, 5, 8, 10, and 16. Now, I know uh, very often, particularly in, uh, in gatherings of this kind, a false dichotomy is very often presented between, if you like, the people who worry about children and what happens to children on the internet and those who are concerned with internet liberties, internet freedom, expanding the internet and so on. And I, I stress, in my opinion, it is a false dichotomy. Because if you look at SDG number 10, which in some ways is the sort of pivotal one, uh, for us is we want every child in the world to be able to access the many, many benefits that the internet has offered to, to, to many, uh, to, to the adult world. Um, certainly in the United Kingdom and in most of the advanced OECD member states, it's now very difficult to imagine how a child or a young person can get an adequate or decent modern education unless they've got access to the internet and a device is appropriate to providing that access. And, and <clears throat> that's why indeed in SDG 10, <clears throat> it speaks about um, a, an aim reducing inequality within and among countries. And that's certainly key for us. And just to just sort of to put some numbers around this, we shouldn't uh, forget uh, or overlook the fact that one in three of every internet user in the world is a child. That's to say, is under the age of 18. This rises to nearly one in two uh, in parts of the developing world. And in fact, in some parts of the developing world, the proportion of users is even higher. So one of the things that we are very keen uh, to see and that we advocate when we come to gatherings of this kind is that that dimension of the internet and the role, the sheer scale of young people's engagement with it is not overlooked because it is still, I'm afraid, too often the case that people have discussions about the internet and internet policy as if everybody who was using it was an adult uh, and it just isn't the case. And children are not a minor or small group or marginal concern, they are a gigantic proportion of internet users around the world. Thank you very much for your comment. May I ask Ms. Minna Morera from the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition to state her intervention. Thank you. Thank you and uh, very pleased to be here representing the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. Um, the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition, uh, through its main work, that is uh, the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet, and which is published in 2011, uh, has been playing a formative role within the IGF community through leadership and outreach on human rights-based frameworks for online environment across all stakeholder groups. Um, the Charter itself resonates and speaks directly to the UN Sustainable uh, Development Goals, and it could focus um, in particular in certain areas, areas that we are covering here this year at the IGF, such as um, environmental issues, refugee rights and emerging technologies. But um, we would also like to uh, focus on innovation through work. And this would relate, for instance, uh, uh, in the Chart of Human Rights and Principles with the Internet on Article uh, 14, uh, which is uh, the right to work, the respect for workers' rights, <coughs> sorry, uh, Clause A and uh, B, Internet at the workplace, and C, work 
uh, through and on the internet. This also relates to the other uh, article that we have, that is Article 16, the rights to consumer protection on the internet. Um, this is because we believe that when it comes to innovation, human rights law and norms and sustainable development should be guiding future appropriate technologies. Thank you, Minda. Thank you. <coughs> Let's uh, talk about education. Uh, let me ask uh, Janet Sawaya from the DC on uh, access in, in libraries to tell us about it. Thank you very much. Public access in libraries refers to the possibility to get online for free in a welcoming non-commercial environment with support and training from qualified staff. This allows for meaningful access to information which in line with the rights-based approach to development promoted by the UN 2030 agenda empowers people to take better decisions for themselves and their communities. This in turn promotes economic, educational, and societal well-being. Just as the SDGs are globally applicable, so too is public access. For those who remain offline, libraries are essential places to get online and access information on almost every topic from health and employment to education and farming techniques. In countries where people have computers and internet at home, libraries complement home access by providing access to support and skills and companionship. Libraries provide three main advantages that with additional leverage can contribute to and enable the attainment of the SDGs. Libraries provide existing infrastructure Connecting libraries is relatively low cost, high impact means of bringing the benefits of connectivity to communities. Libraries already exist in many places, are known and trusted spaces in communities, and are already included in government information programs and supported by programs such as universal service funds and broader government budgets dedicated to libraries and digital infrastructure. Librarians' existing mission is to help people access the information they need. And through broad knowledge of online resources beyond simple searches, librarians help the public to expand their ability to find relevant information and build their digital skills. Libraries provide complementary programs and services, adequately supported libraries with strong internet connections and skills deliver services that contribute to SDG for delivery. For example, public libraries provide digital skills training for marginalized and at-risk communities. Supporting SDGs 4, they support formal education institutions by providing more specific skills in areas such as coding, robotics, web design, and supporting basic education. And aligned with SDG 5, they enable a gender equality in the use of technology. Women often find libraries as safe spaces where they can learn to get online that other public access spaces don't provide. Libraries offer entrepreneurship training and support people in obtaining financial support to start their own businesses. Aligned with SGG8, they help people develop job relevant skills, prepare CVs, and find the right post. Aligned with SGG2, in, in areas such as agriculture, they support farmers access to market information and agricultural extension services, as well as rural development grants. And finally, um, they uh, support improved health and well-being. They serve as key partners for sharing public health information through campaigns and by providing a safe place where people can search for health information freely. This is particularly important for women who may face difficulties accessing the internet at home or even with owning a device. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then I would like to ask Mr. Jerry Ellis from the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability to talk about the opportunities, the promise of technology for people with disabilities. Please. Thank you, Nadia, and thank you to IGF for this opp opportunity for presenting on behalf of the DCAD. There are 1.3 billion people with disabilities globally. These control $1.3 trillion of annual disposable income. Add to these 2.2 billion more people who are emotionally attached like family and friends, and that grows to $8 trillion of disposable income annually. According to the UN Development Program, 80% of people with disabilities live in the developing world. So the Sustainable Development Goals are obviously 
highly relevant to people with disabilities. The Millennium Development Goals didn't address the question of disability, but the Sustainable Development Goals mentions disability specifically 11 times. So it is highly relevant. Many international frameworks exist in the area of disability and include the area of disability. Agenda 2030, the 15 disability specific uh, elements for inclusive cities in the, in the new urban agenda emerging from Habitat 3, WSIS plus 10 and several more, including the, the, uh, the broader Sendai framework. That's only a few, there are more. And there will be a, a flagship report which was commissioned by the uh, UN General Assembly, which will be launched on, the, launched on the UN International Day of Persons with Disabilities on December 3rd this year. All of these are grounded in the groundbreaking United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. A key concept in the UN, CRPD as it's known, is universal design. It says include persons with disabilities at all stages of development design, right through to testing. Using high universal design avoids the high cost of retrospectively including accessibility. But of far more important than that is accessible design is good design for everyone, particularly in aging societies. Our conclusions? Every SDG is highly relevant for the, so, for the social and economic uh, inclusion of persons with disabilities in all areas of society. Universal design is a process that can facilitate this. So we ask you to consider that very seriously in all aspects of development. The United Nations Convention underpins a set of international frameworks for inclusive development. So please consider that when you're looking at inclusive in development. Um, and the last point I'll make to you is the best way to include, ensure that the needs of people with disabilities are included in all your programs and all your activities, ask them. In line with our motto, nothing about us without us. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. <clears throat> How emerging technologies are supporting this development uh, uh, goals and uh, let me offer the floor to uh, Carla Reyes from the DC on blockchain. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> at base, the Dynamic Coalition on Blockchain Technologies views uh, blockchain technologies having the potential to reshape the way individuals fundamentally interact with each other, with the environment, with their communities, with private um, enterprises, and um, We've explored that potential through any number of work streams uh, that promote specific SDGs. Um, for example, uh, we've looked into and uh, worked to produce a prototype of the way blockchain technology could be used to create distributed microgrids that incentivizes the creation and use of clean energy. Uh, we've supported research and discussion regarding the provision of secure attestation and credentials for academic diploma uh, and other skill sets and training. Um, we've looked at uh, the use of blockchain technologies related to supply chain management uh, and in uh, increasing transparency and uh, understanding of interaction with private enterprises. And further, um, uh, we have an ongoing work stream with regards to uh, corporate accountability uh, and blockchain technology. We. Uh, engaged in these uh, work streams have realized uh, both through the work and then just more broadly through interaction with blockchain communities that one thing that will either promote or, or hinder the ability of the technology to reach its potential uh, to um, reshape uh, human interaction in ways that promote the SDGs or promote any other vision for the technology, frankly, um, may be in fact uh, the governance mechanisms for blockchain technology specifically. Um, there is an ongoing debate for those who are aware of the best uh, governance uh, structures for public blockchain protocols uh, and it's our view that um, working those issues out uh, will um, 
either hinder or promote the ability of the technology to fulfill the vision uh, for which it was created. We are um, looking into that connection between blockchain governance and promotion uh, of uh, the SDGs and particularly social good more broadly um, in our dynamic coalition session tomorrow. So we would invite anyone who's interested uh, in participating to do so. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, continue this uh, conversation about emerging tech in support of common development goals and would like to ask uh, Mr. Martin Bottermann from the DC on Internet of Things to uh, make his comments or statement. Thank you very much for that. Uh, basically, digitization is, changing, is uh, shaping the society and will increasingly affect anything we do. Uh, it's also a necessity to be able to deal with all we have in a world that's increasingly intensively used by all of us. So uh, IoT or connected devices will be there to assist us. Uh, they have a lot to offer. At the same time, they also come with dangers. So what the Dynamic Coalition is focusing on very much is to seek an ethical way forward as we believe that's the only way to ensure that IoT development and deployment can happen in a sustainable way, supporting both society and business in the long run. So the challenge is to determine what ethical means in the global level, because that's not my ethics or your ethics. It's different in different parts of the world. It will affect the SDGs uh, dramatically. If, for instance, starting with SDG 2, agriculture, it's clear how much technology can help to increase the crop uh, turnover and, 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 and return on, on, on crops. Uh, already technologies are used today in the advanced countries, but also technology is a fairly easy uh, adaption to improving local uh, crops in terms of irrigation, in terms of uh, crop control, etc. Uh, once it's clear how it's to be used, and this is one of the UN main, main activities at the moment, uh, very much supported uh, by also the Dutch University of uh, Agriculture. Um, same goes for uh, healthy lives, uh, particular environmental warning systems. And there a clear lesson is coming as well if you look for instance to some tsunami warning system which is an IoT enabled system that was put in place with the disaster that is now already 10 years ago but not forgotten and uh, a whole network of tsunami buoys was laid out to give a pre-warning if such disasters would help again. It's just one example because similar things are there for earthquakes etc. Uh, however when time fades away and these disasters don't happen, how do we make sure that the networks uh, continue to be effective? Now I can go along uh, a long list of uh, sustainable development goals and say how IoT or Internet of Things would help that. Uh, but basically, it's about managing systems, it's about monitoring systems, about warning systems. And in that way, it provides uh, also feedback for us to improve processes wherever we talk. Now, crucial in this is capacity building, because they're most effective if they're applied and developed locally uh, by local people uh, to local problems. And uh, a lot of activity is happening there, both in terms of training people and in making things available. Um, the activities uh, vary from training uh, many young entrepreneurs of how to use uh, material to how to, for instance, bring in place local connectivity when a disaster has struck a country and, for instance, taken out the telecom infrastructure. May I ask you to come to your concluding remark? The concluding remark is uh, very much that uh, uh, it's crucial to consider this to make sure that we do it in an ethical way with international norms to uh, uh, warn against abuse and to put a lot of emphasis on local capacity building. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. You know, and let me take from, from you that, you know, local capacity building. That's way easier for big countries 
because they have the economies of scale. And so there are some countries, small islands, uh, that have that challenge. So let me ask uh, Tracy Hackshaw about the detailed coalition on small island developing states and the challenges you face. Thank you. Following the Caribbean, Pacific, and the African, Indian Ocean, Mediterranean, and South China Sea regions, small island developing states, or SIDS, which number 52 at last count, and which comprise approximately 60 million inhabitants, are seeking a greater voice with a higher level of volume in international discourse, especially that relating to the internet governance. According to various reports and documents published by the United Nations and other IGOs, the SID says several common sustainable development challenges. Small populations, as low as under 2,000 in one particular state, limited resources, remoteness, susceptibility to natural disasters, vulnerability to external economic shocks, and excessive dependence on international trade and extractive industries. Indeed, internal economies of many SIDs are characterized by state monopolies, effective monopolies by MNCs or oligopolies, which often lead to price distortions for key goods and services. In the ICT sector, especially the telecommunications subsector, voice and data operators are most likely to be monopolists or oligopolists, with attendant issues related to non-competitive pricing, low levels of customer service, aging infrastructure, a lack of universal accessibility with digital inclusion and digital divide scenarios often playing out to the disadvantage of one or more sectors of the population, including, but not limited to, the rural, women, youth, poor, elderly, and persons with disabilities. Further, faced on a daily basis with severe environmental, in energy, and natural resource management challenges, the SIDS are hard-pressed to take full advantage of the potential in-territory benefits and opportunities made available through emerging technologies such as cloud computing and on-demand ICT type services, given the tremendous amount of consumption of energy, capital and natural resources that the on-demand facilities of this nature demand. In the Pacific Islands, in uh, the recently held Pacific IGF in Vanuatu, there's a recognition by the youth of the Pacific with those from Asia of the wide gap of knowledge and understanding about internet governance. What was acknowledged was a wide disparity created by the lack of access by Pacific youth in general to the internet, mainly due to affordability issues. But Britain's digital divide also encompasses personal disabilities in terms of accessibility to online services and the need to ensure that digital literacy training includes persons with disabilities. In order to deal with affordability issues, there is a need for leaders from key regional ISTAR organizations to encourage governments in the Pacific, perhaps through the Pacific Islands Forum, to focus the ICT strategy on some of the key recommendations made by the Broadband Commission in its latest review, which includes national leadership and development of legislation relating to the effects of digitalization, incentivizing greater access for users by local telcos, and supporting increased digital skills and digital literacy among users to stimulate broadband demand. In the Caribbean... Tracy, your conclusion remark. Sure. In the Caribbean, it was deemed appropriate in the light of managing future regional internet development um, strategies that more Caribbean and Pacific countries should establish regional infrastructures together to increase the public's involvement in policy-making capacity building and collaboration. Small and developing states should also enter the structured partnerships with IGOs and other regional and global IGFs to ensure that the small these, uh, SDGs are met one by one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then I would like to invite Susanya Herring from the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance to talk about skilling and leadership development. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance, YCIG. The community is diverse and consists from stakeholders in a variety of different expert fields, which cover a variety of different SDG goals. However, this year, YCIG members actively engaged with peer-to-peer -peer learning in the domains of media, digital, and cybersecurity literacy, where young people engage in projects and give back to the communities from which they are from. 
This type of engagement increases promotion of the internet governance field and includes the learning of vocational and technical skills that accommodate the new job market, so SDG 4.4 and SDG 8.6. This is clearly noticeable in events such as uh, Youth Dig, the CDIG Youth School, uh, where participants are, for, where initial participants later on become organizers, focal points, and vol uh, volunteers of the community. And another great example from the African region is the digital. Well. It's African, but it's also international. Digital Grassroots, which is a youth capacity building program. Uh, by youth, for youth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then I would leave it to Diego to take on the next part of our uh, session. Thank you so much. Uh, um, I, I like to ask the panelists uh, if you have any questions, remarks, or, or reactions to what you have heard from the Dynamic Coalitions. Anyone? Go ahead, Bishaka. Okay. I think apart from everything, what stays with me is a comment made by the speaker at the Dynamic Coalition on Gender and Internet Governance about the inadequate reporting on gender at the Internet Governance Forum. So one of the things that was institutionalized a few years ago at the IGF was that in the workshop reports that we fill in at each IGF, there must be sort of disaggregated data, just reporting, you know, on how many men and women are present at each session, our moderators, how many times gender is mentioned. And this was a very proactive way of actually trying to measure the role of gender in internet governance and to see whether people of different genders were actually being represented in shaping, influencing, and governing the internet. And I think it is a matter of concern and something that I hope we will take seriously that not even 50% of people who are filling these reports are actually filling the gender part. And to me that speaks of not enough sort of seriousness being given to a topic that we know is crucial to building a safe, open and free internet. And I think related to this, just one very brief point, I think we have to think about the fact that in the world today there are many genders, including transgender people, etc. We very rarely see them in internet governance fora. And at the same time, we know that they are huge users of the internet, particularly when they face stigma and discrimination offline. The online becomes a safe space. And I do believe that as part of our commitment to gender equality, and SDG number five, we have to really think about including all genders and marginalized genders in this conversation. Thank you, Vishaka. Jackson. Uh, thank you. Um, mine is only a concern in regard to connected uh, items or internet of uh, things. Um, from the technological point of view, um, as much as we would wish to have all those items um, in internet, um, for a small gain, uh, are we not uh, converting it to an uh, IoT that's internet of threats because of the standard of which those um, items are being pl uh, plugged to the net without much of security concerns or consideration? Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Andres or Celine, do you? Celine, go ahead. Sure. So I think what's going to stay with me very clearly is the diversity of the challenges that were raised today. Uh, very diverse. Uh, probably the common point that I'm taking away um, is the need to develop access for all and bridge some of the gaps that I've heard in gender, in countries, um, and the need to probably accompany that with education um, across the board and education on, on some of the things that we consider as basic. Um, so clearly access in all its dimension is what's going to stay with me. Thank you for the interventions. Thank you, Celine. Andres? Solo un pequeño comentario para el tema de formación de capacidades. Para el caso de Latinoamérica, por ejemplo, El problema no es que nos invierta en formación de capacidades y capital humano. Se debería invertir más, pero el mayor de los problemas 
y nosotros lo vimos en un reciente estudio que sacamos, es que es la falta de coordinación entre los distintos proyectos que existen. ¿no? Eh, hay bastantes proyectos que no están alineados entre ellos y al final no acaban teniendo la consistencia que deberían y llegando a donde deben. Si hubiese una coordinación a nivel superior en las agendas de gobierno sería bastante más fácil y llegarían a más gente y tendrían mayor utilidad. ¿no? Y es bueno para remarcar algo de lo que se ha comentado antes. Thank you, Andrés. Uh... We have uh, a few minutes uh, before we end. So, Nadia, would you like to, to lead uh, uh, perhaps a discussion with the audience? Thank you very much. So, we have now opened the floor to the audience to intervene, make your own comments, your own remarks. We have our panelists here available, but also the dynamic coalitions are available to comment and answer any of your questions or concerns. I would like to look at our online moderator, Virginia Belchinaite, whether there are currently any comments or questions from online, but if you're watching us from online, please do submit something. We're more than happy to take any of your questions, and she will let us know as soon as something comes in. So are there any um, comments or questions from the audience that would like to be raised? So while people are still thinking, I would like to give Martin Boteman still the opportunity to speak. Well, thank you. It's, it's directly responding to, to Jackson's point, uh, the Internet of Threats. Uh, it's true that every uh, technology comes with uh, threats as well as opportunities. And uh, it's crucial that we use those well. I think you're no, now more aware of how to do that than we used to be in the past. And uh, with those uh, capacity building, uh, it's not only about uh, uh, how to connect things and make things talk with each other, uh, but it's also how to govern these things and how to deal with that. So, yes, it's an important point, and we shouldn't just blindly uh, implement. Uh, but it shouldn't stop us from grasping the benefits that it can bring. So let's do it, but let's do it carefully. Thank you very much for your comment. Are there any other questions in the room which would like to be addressed, or any comments? Everybody is still in the post-lunch kind of getting together again. Would you? Sorry. Yes, please. Now I'm, a, I'm sorry. I'm a little confused because people are pointing at each other. <laughs> sorry. I, I thought someone else had put their hand up first, so I was going to... Uh, Sort of, yeah. uh, sorry, yes, Nigel Hickson, I can. Thank you very much for the uh, uh, presentations. It's been uh, uh, incredibly interesting to listen to uh, everyone. I, I, I just wondered whether the, um, the, the panel, having listened to the, the various contributions from the dynamic coalitions, uh, might be able to sort of comment on how some of the common synergies could be sort of taken forward in the, in the, in the work of the IGF as we, as, as we go forward in terms of the sustainability agenda. Thank you very much. Would we like also, was there another question in the room? Oh, sorry, thank you. We would also take your question. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Marianne Franklin, Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. I'd like to follow up from Nigel's comment and ask, uh, in addition to responding to Nigel's question, if every member of the panel and any DC representative here could uh, succinctly say, how do their priorities relate to sustainability in environmental sense, but also social and cultural ways? Real sustainability, not symbolic sustainability. So I'd just like to issue that challenge, if I may. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone on the panel who would like to make the first comment or remarks regarding these two questions? I can start if you want. Um, all right, so I think on the question of synergies coming from um, the background and, and the, I guess the company I, I work with, I think um, where I see synergies is around education um, and um, the ability to progressively get people onto the web. Um, and um, to support with, I mean, we do have to build education, and I guess we're a bit further downstream, um, but this is one area um, where I see synergies. Um, the other area where I see synergies, although it's probably a bit more indirect, is through the ability of 
Well, I guess in the end, you know, when you, on, on our platform at least, uh, your gender, whatever it is, um, your country, whatever it is, um, your education level, whatever it is, um, is to a degree, um, well, not to a degree, it doesn't matter. Um, so it's one of the examples of one of the areas where you can actually be free um, with obviously some cons well, with some restriction. But this is really why I see the two connecting points with our day-to-day -day life. Please, thank you. Okay, just I'm trying to actually figure out how to respond without being tokenistic to your question about sustainability. Uh, and I think it's not that there's any new formula, to be honest, but I think we have to really deeply take on board some of the things which we have known for the last 10 years, right? About sort of social markers, cultural markers. And I think, honestly, for me, the myth of the neutral user is something that really has to vanish. I think we really have to embrace the fact that users are embodied human beings who come with very different experiences and that we cannot have a online sort of uh, domain which does not account for this kind of diversity very fundamentally in design. I think there's also certain issues like, for instance, some of the conversations around algorithms, etc., and how that will affect our rights, artificial intelligence, I think we really have to generate the knowledge. I think we have to have a deep commitment to human rights and say this is the world we are going to live in going forward. And we're not going to give up on certain basics. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm looking at the dynamic coalitions and seeing whether or not there is any comments or um, remarks that they would like to add to this. Uh, Mr. Jerry Ellis. Thank you. I would say that it's okay to be different because everybody's different. And there is a danger that we do work in silos in different areas of accessibility. And I don't mean for disabilities, but in gender and in religion and in various other things. We tend to say, well, here's one group that has a set of needs. Here's another group that has a different set of needs. Here's another group that has a different set of needs. We need to find ways of working together. There will always be differences, there will always be uh, areas where people have special needs or whatever, but they're, in most cases they're the same needs. So we can choose the ones that are the same, work together on those, and let people be different in different ways in the ones that are different. And what, what that will lead to is better international harmonization of standards and uh, ways of developing. So, for instance, if you want to buy a, a pint of milk from your local supermarket, it doesn't matter if you're disabled or old or young or whatever, the, your needs are the same. Whereas in different areas, maybe in education, your needs might be different. Let's find what we have in common, let's work on those, and let the difference take care of themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any of the other dynamic coalitions who would like to make a comment on the two questions that were raised? Not at this time. Are there any questions in the audience or from online? Thank you very much, please. Hi, Renata Aquino Ribeiro, I'm a Civil Society MAG member and a participant of several coalitions, including the Gendered and DCAD uh, in the Internet Rights and Principles. Um, I would like to say, first of all, that the nature of the dynamic coalitions the name is not um, gratuitous. It is about uh, a group that moves towards change. And um, what we've seen this year in the IGF is the dynamic coalitions becoming even more uh, active on change. And I really like what Gary Ellis just said, uh, that we should focus on what is working uh, and, and let uh, the, uh, what is going on that isn't working to be sorted out because we need to be resilient and we need to move forward. And uh, first of all, um, it, it has been a great year for the DCs. Congratulations on, on your work. And I would just wonder, going ahead, uh, there was a big point at uh, the, niche, the beginning of the year that uh, the MAG asked itself, 
when chartering the intercessionals. Is there an end to this change? Is there a day that a dynamic coalition can say, my work here is done? Uh, or uh, what do we do to keep this work alive? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting question. And we would like to open that up to the dynamic coalitions. Um, would you like to reply to this question? I feel kind of torn because also my dynamic coalition is here. I represent the Youth Coalition Internet Governance. So I kind of want to answer that question. Am I allowed to? But in the meantime, please, from uh, DJ, DC Core Values, Core Internet Values. Uh, uh, yeah, my response to the question, what do we do to keep this work alive, is uh, in the name itself, uh, inversely, that it's a dynamic, it's ongoing. What is important is that uh, we don't move from one IGF to another, but keep working all year around on the common issues. And uh, what is common, in my opinion, is the internet. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Perhaps Carla Reyes and afterwards Martin Botamon. I think the technology changes and the nature of the internet changes over time and in response our work changes. So to the extent that the technology and the issues surrounding the technology continue to change, we will continue to be relevant. Uh, and I think we can expect that to be ongoing sort of indefinitely, frankly. Thank you very much. Mr. Boltemann? Yes, what we found is that uh, we had very good discussions here over the years at IGF to develop faults and, and a paper that is very solid, yet it's a paper at IGF. Uh, so how do we get this to act? Uh, very happy to say that uh, we found big organizations uh, available to deepen the work that we've been doing, in particular on two aspects. One is security of IoT. Uh, Jackson made the right point. Uh, security is a prerequisite. We need to get that right. Uh, so uh, uh, information society is going to help us to, to, to get a good over, uh, over, oversight paper that can guide all kind of work throughout the world on this. The other part is the ethical dimension. Uh, ethical is crucial, yet it means so, so much different things to different people. And a lot of work has been done both by the World Economic Forum, but also by UNESCO, by countries, by industry, by uh, NGOs. Uh, the other thing that uh, uh, World Economic Forum has uh, agreed to is to help develop uh, an overview paper on what we really need to talk about when we focus on ethical aspects of IoT implementation. And I think these are crucial elements. This is how you take it out both by diving in on the elements that are important, but also by uh, involving organizations that have an interest and a, a clear role in getting it out there. Thank you very much. Mr. Hackshaw? Yes, thank you. So um, I think it's, um, we are a new dynamic coalition. We just started this year, and I am impressed with the visibility that the DCs have gotten in the IGF. I think that could be improved further. And to do that, I think um, some of the work that's happening here, and I don't want to sound controversial, also happens in other UN fora, such as the ITU and other UN agencies. There seems to be an opportunity here to, to sort of have the work, um, I want, I'm, not, I'm not going to use the word merge, but certainly some collaborative structures in place so that the work that's happening here can be made visible to the other um, work that's going on in other agencies in that way sustainability and, and future funding and all those things can probably um, can, can happen on its own. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your comments. As we come to the end of the question and answer session, I would like to invite uh, Diego to make the summary remarks for our session. What a difficult task. <laughs> you know, we, we've talked about so many diverse topics here. But the, the, the first thing that uh, really is my takeaway that I'm very happy to see that IGF is working on such a number of important issues. And I encourage people to also join the dynamic co coalitions to uh, deepen the, the discussion and, the, um, and perhaps as, as many people are saying here, we need to 
to, to see what is next. What does the IGF ha uh, have to do uh, next? We have to narrow down those discussions into uh, perhaps alternatives of uh, uh, different alternatives of uh, uh, policies to, 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 to make. Uh, but uh, the second takeaway is what uh, Jackson started uh, his uh, talk about, which was this is not about technology. If we want to have inclusive and pros prosperous digital transformation, this is about people, not about technology. And if you see the parallels, they all talk about people, and especially education. Jackson talked about leaders. Uh, <clears throat> we talk about, you know, Michelle talk about women. Andres talk about young people. Uh, <clears throat> Celine talked about SMEs that are run by people. Uh, so the, the, the main challenge is how we prepare people for this new economy. And <clears throat> that's, that's the main challenge. And, and we, when we see everybody is really working hard on the transformation of different industries, but very few people are talking about the digital transformation of higher education, for example. So people are talking about, uh, of course, reskilling people, but, but we, we have to really work hard on how to really prepare our people for that future. That's the main issue, because the main gap today is that one. The infrastructure gap is closing very fast. Of course, we still have to work hard on that. But the main issue is how we prepare people to be good users. The, and, and then how we prepare them to be creators, innovators, with the right skills to do that. So <clears throat> I think we have quite inter interesting challenges in front of us. And the main challenge is to make sure that this new world is going to be for the well-being of everybody. Thank you so much for being here today in this panel. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, thank you all very, very much. I would like to thank our uh, panelists. I would also like to thank all the dynamic coalitions who are able to present their work. Um, I would also like to thank the online moderator, Virginia Balchunaite, and of course, all the translators and captioners that are uh, here today to be able to ensure that we have this opportunity very much. Thank you very much to Timea and Yuta from the MAC who helped organize this session. And I hope you all have a lovely day. And of course, Marcus Kuma, the DCA coordination group. So thank you all very much to, uh, for coming here and we hope to see you for the rest of the IGF.